he took it this morning and never gave it back. And I was like, I kind of need that for preaching, you know. Anyway, um, Children's Church is dismissed if we have any. Yeah, I think I, do we have any? We have a lot of people out. I don't know if you noticed that. A lot of people are sick. They're dealing with surgeries. They're dealing with a lot of things. And during our prayer and testimony time, we'll, we'll talk about some more of those things. But just be mindful of that. If, it, if somebody comes to mind, pray for them right then and there. I don't know if you're like me, but if I don't pray for it right then and there, I'll forget about it. <laughs> so I have to pray for it right then and there. So I'll just be mindful of that. But isn't it great that we have technology where they can join us at home? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? That's just great. Um, so let's pray, and then we're going to jump into this. My Father, my God, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you for um, the people that are here, um, that are able to be here, that um, you're just protecting our health, protecting our ability to get here. And, and Lord, you brought these people here to hear this sermon, to worship you, to experience you in some way during this worship time. So Lord, I pray that your words would be in my mouth, that you would open our hearts and our minds to wisdom and understanding, and that you would receive the glory in this. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, if you didn't know, today's Father's Day. And if you didn't know that, get on the phone, call your father after service. After service, not during service, okay? Um, but it's important, um, and uh, the question always comes when Father's Day comes around, what does it mean to be a father, right? And then you sit there, well, that's a loaded question, right? Depending on who your father was, right? And, um, but unfortunately, in our society, that's not even the main question. One of the main questions in our society is a lot of males don't understand what it means to be a man let alone a father. Is it true? Yes. I mean, that's true. Um, here at GBC, at Grace Bible Church, uh, we have a program that we're going through. It's called Authentic Man, Authentic Manhood. And uh, we've been doing this for over a year. And last year, I spoke an introduction to uh, Authentic Man, the first volume. We've gone through three volumes of the six-volume series. And uh, it's been very powerful in a lot of the men's lives. And I spoke through it because uh, we were going to go into season, you know, the next sec session, volume two. And after I got done, there was a lot of men that wanted to go through the first session again before we jumped into two and three. And so this year, I thought it was important that we talk about the second volume. And so a lot of the material I got is from the Authentic Manhood series. Um, so I want to give credit where credit is due. But it has made such a huge impact in my life and a lot of the men's lives in this church that I really wanted to talk about fathers and dads. And um, in the second series, the, the, the theme of it is a man and his story. And that's the overarching theme. And we're just going to be talking about really one section of the six sessions in there. And it's about dads. Men and women. I don't want the women here to tune out, because this is important. You're going to learn something about the men in your life in this sermon. And so I think it's important that you pay attention, because there might even be some things about your husband that you've been married to for a long time. You're like, really? It's important. So men, the life we are meant to have is not just about intellect, willpower, and morality as it is about giving our hearts to the God who loves us and to the people who need us. This helps us to be a blessed to live fully and love deeply and lead well. When we give our hearts to God who loves us and to people who need us. But it's a hard thing on how to judge that. How do we give our hearts? When do we give our hearts? How much do we give our hearts? All these things are questions that we have in our brains. And there is a very interesting story in this, in the reading of the second chapter of this book. And it talked about a little boy. Uh, he had a brother, an older brother. And the, the boy was 9 or 10. And his older brother was 12. And his older brother was very athletic, hitting home runs. How many men love to hear a ho hit a home run? Oh, yeah, we like it, right? Cause, yes. Because we're in the center of the stage, you know, we hit it, and everybody's looking at us. And we're like, yeah, and we're like, yes. Well, this little brother 
had a hard time. He wasn't athletic as athletic as his older brother. And there was some years difference. And he, they were driving home from a game, and the little brother was saying, uh, Dad, because his big brother did all these great things, and his little brother dad said, Dad, do you remember when I hit that home run? And the dad was driving, and he said, uh, no, son. And he said, no, no, you remember. You know, I hit it. It was that other day back then. I'm sorry, son, I don't remember that. And the son started to get tearing up and getting, you remember I hit it and it bounced over the fence. Now his dad was sitting there, his heart tearing to pieces because his son's in the back looking for validation. I did this, I'm as good as my brother. And he was struggling because it would have been so easy to say, oh yeah, I remember that. But anybody that knows baseball, you don't get a home run for a ball bouncing over the fence. It has to fly over the fence. And his son, and the dad was struggling. Do I be truthful? This is going to hurt my son. Or do I be, you know, just placate? Okay, okay, I'm not going to worry about it. But his dad said, no, I'm walking. I want my son to walk in the knowledge of the word of God. And that's not truth. And he said, no, I don't, son. And he got angry. He's just crying. He's upset. He just stopped talking. And when they got home, got out of the car, his father said, son, I want you to come over here and talk to me in private. And his son, no, I'm not going to. He's just stomping all around, just angry, going into the house, slamming the door. And his father just went over and sat down on the step on the porch. And finally the son came out and sat down on the porch. And you know how he sat down. You know, sit up, okay, I'm here. And he's upset and crying. And his dad said, you know, son, I love you for who you are. I don't love you because you hit home runs. You're my son. God's made you special the way you are. And whether you hit a thousand home runs or no home runs, if you ever play sports or never play sports, I love you because God gave you to me. And you're my son. And I love you for who you are, not for what you do, but for because you are my son. That's pretty significant, isn't it? It validated that son, and that son, instead of crying away, he grabbed his dad and cried on his dad's chest, and then leaned his head on his knee and just sat there and cried and cried and cried, and his dad, his dad just hugged him and loved on him. Men, we are made to live fully, deeply, and lead well. We are made to do so by living a life of passion, intimacy, and integrity. But how do we find that doorway of living this life? Right? That's the question a lot of men are saying. My dad was not the best example. How do I do that? I didn't have an example. What, what do I, what, how do I do that? How do we find the doorway of living this life that you just described? First, we have, to, we have to learn how to feel our feelings through the Word of God. We have to learn how to feel our feelings. How many of us have our feelings on our sleeve? How many of us show our feelings, even to our wives? Because our society says to be a man is what? Don't show your feelings. You gotta be rock hard. You gotta look like Schwarzenegger and act like him. Be. Not only do we need to learn how to feel our feelings, but we need to tell the truth about our feelings. That goes back to our whole church, remember, when we ask somebody, how are you doing? Are we willing to say how we're really doing? Or do we lie? Oh, I'm fine. And the wheels of our life are coming apart. We need to tell the truth of our feelings through the word of God. God tells us to tell the truth. And lastly, we need giving these experiences to God and others. 
We need to be willing to share that with others, our feelings, how we're doing. We're not made to be monks on a hill somewhere. We're made to have fellowship interaction with one another. We're made to have fathers and son relationship. We're made to have a husband-wife relationship. We're made to have relationships. But if we keep it all bottled up, what happens? There's no growing of a relationship. There's no de deepening of the relationship. It's just all surface. I've been, I haven't been a pastor very long, but it's amazing to me in marriage counseling what happens. He never says anything. He never speaks. I don't know what's going on in his life. I wish he would just do anything. To find our feelings, we must identify, explore, and express what is happening to us. And for men, is that easy? It's not even easy with other men, let alone women, our wives. But God is saying we need to be transparent. And there's a story that's in the Bible that's just really impacting when you think about what's going on. And that's John 21, 15 through 17. And what happened is here is Peter, this is after the crucifixion and after Jesus has been raised from the dead. And Peter, before the crucifixion, Jesus is saying, I'm going to go die. And you know what Peter said? No way. I'm going to die with you if that happens. And Jesus looked at him and said, before this night is through, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Guess what happened? Peter denied him three times. And then when that rooster crowed, he remembered, and he went away and wept bitterly. He was so sad. Then when Jesus is raised from the dead, he's like, this is great. Jesus is alive. But what's hanging over his head? That denial. Listen to this verse. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he, because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Why did Jesus continue to beat home the point? Jesus wasn't being cruel. Jesus was trying to help Peter. How was he helping him? Revisiting his past. Notice he did it three times. How many times did Peter deny him? Three times. He tried to help him fully understand his story. Look at Peter. Do you love me? Do you repent? Do you want to follow me? Yes, Lord, I love you. And he was preparing Peter for the future. Because look, did Peter get hurt? It says it. It hurt Peter. And I love the Bible because it's so brutally honest. It puts it out there. And if Jesus didn't deal with this with Peter, Peter would have never spoken boldly for Jesus. You know it's true. You know why? Because he would certainly carry guilt and self-doubt around with him. Am I going to do this again? I was so convicted and strong to stay with him. And then when the first testing came, what happened? I failed. And another very important thing, perhaps others wouldn't question Peter's, would question Peter's trustworthiness. You denied him once already. Jesus restored him. Peter needed restoration and forgiveness for his failures. Do we need that, men? Jesus did that in person with Peter. Men, our definition of manhood, this came back from last year's, uh, reject passivity. 
You need to stop being passive, sitting on the couch. You need to stop saying, my wife will deal with the kids. You need to accept responsibility. You need to say, hey, I need to be engaged with my children. I need to be engaged with my father. And you need to lead courageously. When I'm talking about this, how many of you think, my dad? Uh. But you need to lead courageously. You need to say, yes, I want a relationship with my dad. And thirdly, you need to invest eternally. God is saying, look, I'm your heavenly father. I'm not like your dad. But you guys together could come to me and know me more intimately. And you can invest internally in each other as father and son. Men, every one of us have a story. Is that not true? We do. It doesn't matter what age you are, you have a story. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't know how to deal with these hurts and these hopes and emotions that have been damaged or changed or gone haywire. But unfortunately, these things that happen, we live our lives a lot of time by those defining moments, those hurts, those unex, uh, un, 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 unrealized hopes, or these emotions that we don't know how to deal with. We're driven by these. And a lot of these events we don't understand. Is that true? Oh, come on, you know it's true. Women, you, you think that your men have it all together, they don't. There's things that they don't understand, they can't process, they don't understand how to deal with. These events, these events that are so shaping in our lives, a lot of times we don't even want to look at them. We hide them. We get rid of them. We need to look back and figure out what shaped us and evaluate these events. Do we need to keep on doing these things that we're doing now because of this event? Or do we need to get rid of these things that we're doing because of this event? Or do we need to tweak it, need to change it a little bit? Addictions are a great example of how men deal with these expectations, these hopes, these hurts, these emotions that they can't deal with. They get addicted to things. Fathers impact us greatly. There's a video in the presentation where it's significant as you listen to the sons talk about their dads. Can you relate to one of them, two of them, or all of them? Let's listen. My dad, my dad was, um, my dad was my best friend, basically. He um, instilled a lot of things into me. He was very instrumental in teaching me um, the responsibilities of a man. I lost my dad when I was 22. I remember the summers that my dad would take me to Major League Baseball games and we'd do road trips together. And Not a day goes by that I don't wish that I could talk with him or just hang out with him. I was seven years old when my father left our family. We were standing in the driveway saying goodbye and he rubbed my head like he's going to the office. And then bam, he was gone. He abandoned us. How can anybody do that to a seven-year-old kid? You know what? I don't even have a dad. My dad left me, my family, and my mother for a woman who's two years older than me. Who does that? Who, who does that to a family? He destroyed our family, and he just doesn't care. He was a joy to be around, you know? He, if I'm, every time I was in a bad mood or upset about something, I'd sit down and talk with him. Almost instantly, I'm in a better mood, you know? And I'm laughing, and I'm like, oh, you know, I was supposed to be sad, I was supposed to be angry. Well, why am I laughing right now, you know? And uh, that's just what he did. 
That's one of the things I really loved about him. You know, my dad, he was, he, he was more of a buddy than a father, really. You know, his whole philosophy was you work hard and you play hard. And we did play hard, played real hard. You see, my dad, he taught me, he taught me his version of what it meant to be a man. And he led me down a whole lot of, lot of roads that just end up being dead ends. One bad decision after another, and I'm still paying for it to this day. My dad, my dad, my dad, my dad. Pretty powerful, right? Men, we have a huge responsibility as dads because it impacts our kids. And for you that aren't dads, someday you will be a dad. What kind of dad are you going to be? Are you going to fo follow in your father's footsteps? The bad? Are you going to be just like him? We all have wounds in our lives. Did you notice that as we looked at that? It was incredible, the impact that those dads had. And a wound is any unresolved issue where a lack of closure adversely impacts or shapes the direction and dynamic of a man's life now. We pretend we don't have them, right? We don't have these wounds. We pretend, oh, I'm good. I'm self-actualized. In the Midwest, one of the things that um, that culture in the Midwest was is men don't cry. And I was an emotional kid growing up. But man, when I got around my friends that were boys, and when I got around other dads, it was, hey, don't cry. Buck up. In that sense, that culture took out one of the greatest gifts God has given to me. And that's another reason why my son, Logan, who has a soft, tender heart, when he was exposed to the culture that said, hey, don't cry, you know, be like other men, be strong. And he comes to me and he says, Dad, how can I not cry so much? And I say to him, Logan, that's one of God's greatest gifts in your life. I pray every day that you don't lose that heart. Because I didn't lose it completely. It's coming back. Even now, I'm starting to tear up. You know. But culture and people around us can impact us to change what God has given us. These wounds that we have are soul wounds. They're not physical wounds. Not wounds that we can see on the outside on, on our skin, but it's our soul wounds. And the soul wounds comes out what? in the way we act. But I got a, I got a encouraging for you. God can redeem your past and bless your future. Do you hear me, men? Women that are married to some of these men that are this way, God can redeem and bless and your future. Redeem your past, bless your future. You doubt me. Well, look, Romans 8, 28, we say this all a lot. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God has a plan for your life. Men, dads are very significant in our lives. And Lord willing, someday you will be a dad. Whether your dad... Whether your dad was present, absent, good or bad, the father-son relationship is significant in shaping us. Is that not true? You just saw it. Wasn't it significant? I mean, Proverbs 17, 6. There you go. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their father. Glory means object of pride, the reason for boasting. 
Every father gets undeserved admiration from their son the minute they come into this world. I mean, recent research indicates that fathers uniquely add value to their children. I can tell you all the negatives, but the positive, children with involved fathers are more likely to have better grades, better verbal skills, more confidence, and better physical health. That's the world saying this. Do you ever hear that? You never hear that. Fathers are portrayed as the dorks on TV. The cat, the family cat, has more intelligence to save the family than the father, according to TV. I'm serious. That's what they show. They need to be rescued by the family pet, not their father. None of us were raised by perfect fathers, though. Did anybody have a perfect father? I didn't. I am not the perfect father. I mess up. Just ask my kids. They'll tell you. Our fathers have left all of us wounded in one degree or another, sometimes not even realizing it. And as I said before, this wound is defined as any unresolved issue where a lack of closure adversely impacts or shapes the direction or dynamics of a man's life. But there's a father wound. And the father wound is defined as an ongoing ongoing emotional, social, or spiritual defect that caused by a lack of healthy relationship with dad and now must be overcome by other means. It is a cause by a lack of connection, a lack of relationship, a lack of direct, sustainable, uh, substantiated directive guidance by the dad. How did your dad relate to you? Did your dad give you a vision, give you a focus, give you a purpose? Or did your dad just say, good luck? The root of how, the, the root of a lot of the men's problems is how you deal with your dad's imperfections. Not your imperfections, your dad's imperfections. Because your dad's imperfections, how he dealt with that, directly affected you. I mean, look at John 21, that, that section we talked about with Peter and, and Jesus and how they interacted. If Jesus hadn't taken the, advantage, taken the um, initiative to restore Peter, how would Peter have dealt with it? He would have been filled self guilt. He would have been self-pity. He would have said, I can't be used by Jesus. Jesus was perfect and he told me and I blew it. But what did Jesus do? He dealt with Peter's imperfections. Jesus was the only perfect father. God is the only perfect father and he dealt with Peter. Guess what? Peter had to deal with his children, whether they were biological or not. And he had to deal with that imperfection. Did he hide it? No. He, he said, because of my imperfection, God saved me. God is using me now, and God can use you. These imperfection that comes into our, uh, into our lives that we get from other people, it, it makes us imperfect. We start to question ourselves. We start to deal with things that we don't know how to deal with. There's a... There's a poem that's made by this guy that's an authentic man and we're going to watch this and it, it is a powerful please listen to the words every time i hear it i feel the emotion of him and i get emotional because of what this man had to go through because of his dad let's listen As a boy, I shared a game with my father. We played it every morning till I was three. He would knock, knock on my door, and I'd pretend to be asleep till he got right next to the bed. Then I would get up and jump into his arms. Good morning, Papa. And my poppy would tell me that he loved me. We shared a game, knock, knock, till that day when the knock never came. And my mama takes me on a ride past cornfields on this never-ending highway. To reach a place of high, rusty gates, 
A confused little boy I entered the building, carried in my mama's arms. Knock, knock. We reach a room of windows and brown faces. Find one of the windows sits. My father, I jump out of my mama's arms and run joyously towards my papa's, only to be confronted by this window. I knock, knock, trying to break through the glass, trying to get to my father. I knock, knock, as my mama pulls me away before my pop even says a word. And for years, he has never said a word. And so years later, I write these words as a little boy in me who still awaits his papa's knock. Hope I come home because I miss you. Miss you waking me up in the mornings and telling me you love me. Hope I come home says things I don't know and I thought maybe you could teach me how to shave, how to dribble a ball, how to talk to a lady, how to walk like a man. Hope I come home said I decided a while back I want to be just like you, but I'm forgetting who you are. And years later, a little boy cries, and so I write these words, and I try to heal, and I try to father myself, and I dream up a father who says the words my father did not. Dear son, I'm sorry I never came home. Every lesson I failed to teach here these words. Shave in one direction with strong, deliberate strokes to avoid irritation. Dribble the page with the brilliance of your ballpoint pen. Walk like a child of God, and your wife will come to you. No longer will I be there to knock on your door. You must learn to knock for yourself. Knock, knock, down doors of racism and poverty that I could not. Knock, knock, on doors of opportunity for the lost brilliance of the men who crowd these cells. Knock, knock, with diligence for the sake of your children. Knock, knock, for me, for as long as you are free, these prison gates cannot contain my spirit. The best of me still lives in you. Knock, knock, with the knowledge that you are my son, but you are not my choices. Yes, we are our father's sons and daughters, but we are not their choices, but despite their absences, we are still here, still alive, still breathing with the power to change this world, one little boy and girl at a time. Knock, knock, who's there? We are. Pretty powerful. There's two common responses to the father wound. The first one is anger and pain. Anger and pain. Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Fathers, we need to give life instructions. How many of us just say, I hope you do better than me? And we don't give them direction. I've said it once, I've said it before. I hope my kids' basement, they're, they're, they build on top of my ceiling. I want them to do better than me. But if I don't give them instructions, where are they starting? Alongside of me, instead of building on top. Colossians 3.21, fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Provoking means wear your children out. How many of you are wearing your children out? Wives, you can help your husbands not wear your children out. My wife has had to do that our whole marriage because sometimes I react poorly and I don't even mean to. Sometimes my face says I'm disgusted with you and inside I'm like, I love you. But my face is saying something totally different than my emotions, the way I feel. And my wife has to say, is that what you meant? Because you look like you want to kill them. <laughs> we need people to help us. Without a dad, there's a vacuum in a son's life. We need our fathers to help us, guide us, direct us, teach us. Because we won't always be there. One of the things that guys said, did you hear that? Hey. You're, you're going to become the father. You're going to be the knocker. Are you helping your son become the knocker? And when you leave this hole in a son's life, when the dad's not there, when the dad's not filling that hole, you know what it fills with? Rage. Anger. And you wonder why our society is the way it is? 
Where are the dads? Where are the men? The second one is bottling up your feelings. You pretend like you're not affected. This hurt. Did you hear the emotion of that man? Was he hurt? He was hurt. He didn't understand. He missed his dad. And that hurt will express itself somehow. It'll express itself in unhealthy ways. And this hunger for the dad to be there will come out in addictions, obsessions, performance. You wonder why we have so many workaholics? They're trying to impress their dad. You wonder why there's so many obsessions? Well, I have all of these recreational vehicles. Why? I'm trying to impress my dad. Look at all the stuff I get. Look at all the fun I can do. I don't need him. Or how about the addictions? Just trying to numb the pain. Whether that's alcoholism, lust, um, just addiction in drugs, in TV. You look at this and you're like, oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> and so because we're all sinners and we're messed up, screws up, are, is there hope? There's the authentic men in your group. Yes, there is hope. It's called healing and reconciliation. Men, is that easy? No. And I want to give you five guidelines with dealing with wounds from your mom or dad. Things that your mom and dad have done that have wounded you and things you have to deal with. And how can you deal with it? The first one is you've got to choose to deal with your wound responsibly. Deal with the wound responsibly. Because there's so much of irresponsibility right now dealing with this wound. Dealing, trying to fill it with worldly things. And how does that work out? It doesn't. Look at the scripture here. Psalms 32, 2 and Jeremiah 17, 14. It says, O oh Lord my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O oh Lord, if you heal me, I will be truly healed. If you save me, I will be truly saved. My praises are for you alone. Where does that, where does that dealing with this wound come from? We have to go to Jesus. We have to go to God. God is the perfect father. He's the one that can help you heal from this wound. But how many of men do that? How many men are in church? Why are there more women in church than men? I'm sorry, that's a statistic. Men say, I can deal with this on my own. They tell me not to show my emotions. I'm a man. Is that a man? No. Number two, you should begin the process of forgiveness. Begin the process of the forgiveness. Is this easy? No. Did Peter not get hurt when he got in that process of forgiveness and reconciliation? Peter was hurt. He said it was. The Bible said he was hurt. But it was needed. Why? So Peter could advance in the future. Advance into what God has called him to. Men, if you want to advance, you have to forgive. Look at this. Psalms 147.3. He heals the broken hearted and bandages their wounds. Jesus over and over said, forgive, forgive. It's not easy. That's why you have to go to God and God helps you bandage your wounds and helps you get over those wounds. Why? So you can advance. So you can be the dad you need to be. You can be the father you need to be. But John, I don't have any kids. Look in this room. How many boys in this room need help? Need a father to come alongside them? A responsible man to say, I like you for who you are, not for what you do. Number three, share your story with some trustworthy men. I got to say, this is fascinating because when we started Authentic Manhood, there wasn't a lot of people sharing. 
But when we got through the first, the second session, guess what happened? People started sharing. And the neat thing was that men were not judging other men. They were sympathizing, empathizing, coming alongside them. How many times, men, when we started, there was a situation, a man was crying, did we stand up, gather around that man, and pray for that man? We put a hand on them and said, we understand, we're here for you. And we want to help you. Look at this, James 5, 16, it says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Do we share prayer requests? Yes. Why? So we can share each other's burdens. So we can come alongside each other and say, I was like that once. God got me through that once. God is faithful. You can trust him. Isn't that awesome, you guys? Fourth, if you're married, tell your wife of your unresolved issues. A lot of times, men, our wives do not understand us. They look at us and say, what is the matter with you? And you know what we say? Nothing, I'm a man. When we need to share and say, look, there's some stuff I need to deal with. I need your help, I need your encouragement, I need you to help me deal with this wound. I mean, there's not much more clear picture, there's not a clearer picture in the Bible than Genesis 2.24 when it says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two become united into one. Your wife is part of you. Why does she not know everything about you? because she might reject me like my dad did. Did you hear that, women? Did you see the significance of that rejection in the men's voices? Women, do you want to know your husband? Are you ready to hear what he's dealing with? Because it can be significant. And your reaction can either help the healing or add to it. Five, try to get to the point of having a direct but respectful conversation with your dad. Now when I wrote this down and I read this in the thing, I said, wow, this is huge for men. Because you know how many of us as boys like to confront our father? I will say a lot of us are scared of our father because he was always this imposing person or he was gone. We didn't even know him. Men, we need to be able to confront our fathers in love and say, listen, Dad, this really hurt me, but I love you and I forgive you and I want a relationship with you. Well, my father's dead. Write a letter. Write a letter that won't be sent, but just writing it, putting your feelings on the paper about, Dad, this really hurt me. Dad, I don't, but Dad, through Jesus, I forgive you because what Jesus did for me, I'm going to forgive you. Is that easy? Is it necessary? Jesus Christ is our example, right? What did Jesus do to reconcile us with our Father? <laughs> Not easy. He came, he gave up everything. Everything in the universe. He, he set aside his divine divinity and became fully man. At any time, he could have picked up his divinity again. But he set that aside so he could become fully man to live a perfect life. And then he chose to die for us. Not just any death, just not like a gun, done. This was hours of torture and humiliation. And then the ultimate sacrifice, his dad turning his back on Jesus. Think about that. 
God the Father and God the Son, this intimate, eternal relationship without beginning, without end. And for three days, a moment in time, not three days, I'm sorry, for that hour, two hours, three hours, where God the Father turned his back away from Jesus Christ was the only point in eternity that that happened. You think that was significant? And he did it for us. Fathers, what are you doing? What are you willing to do for your child? Are you willing to relearn on how to be a father? Are you willing to invest in your son? I mean, look at this. Matthew 18, 23 and 24. So if you, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice. Fathers, if you have offended your son, if you have done something wrong, what does this mean? Go to your son and apologize. Reconcile with your son. Sons aren't off the hook. Matthew 5.15, that's right up there. I mean, Matthew 18.23 was less, but Matthew 5.15. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Sons, if your father has offended you, go in love and confront him. In love. But you don't know my dad. He might hate me. He might beat me. He might not listen. That's where you have friends. You need other men in your life to come around you. And you need Jesus Christ to come and help you do what he wants you to do. Galatians 6.1 Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Men in this church, do you like where our society is at? There are men and women that are fatherless, that are guideless. They don't know what's going on. They don't have direction. They don't understand what they should be doing. They're shooting from the hip. What are you willing to do to help others? What are you willing to do to help your own family? What are you willing to do to help others in this own church? We are called to be fathers, men of integrity. We're to live life passionately and deeply and enjoy and enjoy life, even in the hard times. But how many of us try to do it on our own without God? How many of us try to do it on our own without other men in our lives? I hope this gives you a nice little glimpse into what we're dealing with in Authentic Man and how we're dealing, we're trying to become more true men, godly men as we go through this. It's not easy. As you can see, it's not easy. These wounds run deep. And sometimes we don't even know we have them. That's why we need other men and other people in our lives. That's why we need to get in the book and let the Holy Spirit convict us of things in our lives or convict us of things, bring things to mind, what we need to deal with. The question is, men, are you willing to deal with it? The question is, women, are you willing to help your man deal with it? I'm excited because what God is doing in me through this study. I hope you come to Authentic Manhood when we start it up again in August, August, September. And I pray that you will become more true and true, become an authentic man. Let's pray. My Father, my God, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for the series. I thank you for the men that put it together. And Lord, I thank you for this church that was willing to buy the supplies and willing to go through it and the men to come around together and work together to become true men of God. Lord, bless the fathers. Thank you for the fathers that are here. Thank you for the fathers that are investing in their children. And Lord, help us to continue to grow in that. And Lord, if there's fathers here that need to change, I pray that you will just help them to change and help them become the men you want them to be and the dads that you want them to be. 
And finally, Lord, I pray for those that aren't even married yet, that haven't become dads. I pray that you will help them to overcome their past, overcome the failures of their dad, that they would have a better relationship with their dad and a better relationship with you, and that you would help them be the dads you want them to be, and that we can change the next generation to have men that are following you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a time of testimony and question and answer and a petition or pray, uh, prayer requests. Um, Bonnie May.